Hello, everyone. We'll give a couple more minutes for folks to sign in. All right, it's 9.02 and we have a busy day ahead. Um, so I just wanna say welcome everyone or welcome back uh, to the Nylon Dev Days. So this has been a four day event. This is the final day of that uh, event, um, the Nylon Scientific Day. And we have a lot of, uh, I think, really exciting talks lined up. But before we get started with those, I just wanted to provide a little bit of an intro, um, particularly for folks who may not have had a chance so far to participate in the Nylon Dev Days or may not be totally familiar with what Nylon is. So let me just quickly share my screen. Okay. And then... Perfect. All right. So as I mentioned, uh, today's the final day, but you may be asking, I, you know, I heard about this event, I'm really excited for it, but I don't really know what Nylearn is. So what is Nylearn? Um, Nylearn is a toolbox designed for machine learning for neuroimaging data in Python. Um, it's been around for a little while now and it's, it's gained quite a bit of traction in the community uh, for this use and also for um, handling neuroimaging data a bit more broadly for things like plotting as well. It was first released in 2014, wherein it was primarily based on work from the parietal research team at INRIA. Um, since then, however, it's grown to a community of over 100 contributors located around the world. Uh, so I myself am not based at, or affiliated at all with the parietal research team at INRIA. I'm in fact based at McGill University in Montreal, um, where I work with uh, J.B. Pauline. And so it has at least hopped an ocean, uh, but I think it's in fact hopped several oceans and, and we're very lucky to have gotten such a broad contributor base around the world who are all really invested in seeing this tool grow and develop. So this, you know, this tool has been around for a little while. Why did we decide to hold the Nylearn Dev Days now? Um, well, one reason was that Nylearn had been developing for a number of years, but uh, more recently, there was also developments to create uh, something that was at the time called NYSTATS. And the idea was that it would take a lot of the Nylearn style syntax um, and implementation methods and use them to create methods to apply statistical analysis. Um, so whereas Nylearn had really focused on machine learning, the, the original idea with NYSTATS was to really focus on um, statistical analyses that are commonly used in neuroimaging. And with the fact that recently these two packages merged into a single Nylearn package, uh, we felt it was only appropriate that Nylearn should get a new, slightly broader mission statement to reflect 
um, its, its new standing. And so the new Nylern mission statements reads that Nylern enables approachable and versatile analyses of brain volumes. It provides statistical and machine learning tools with instructive documentation in an open community. And we've spent the past two days, um, I think, really working on, on making sure this mission statement always rings true. Um, so the Dev Days was in fact conceived as a four day event to highlight this mission statement and in particular to work on the open community um, and the, the new approaches for versatile analyses of brain volumes. We wanted to make sure that we could onboard new contributors as well as consider new directions for development. Um, and in part, this last idea is what the scientific day is helping us to do. But I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. First, I just wanna provide some updates from the events that have happened so far in the Nylon Dev Days, because if you haven't had a chance to attend, I hope that you'll at least be able to look back or, or maybe check the GitHub repository, um, because we've had a lot of exciting things happen recently. So for the software day, this occurred on Tuesday, the 19th of May, um, and we were lucky to have seven speakers who shared their experience in developing open community-driven software for science. Um, and I think this was well received by the community. I certainly enjoyed it. Uh, we had over 100 simultaneous attendees on the Crowdcast platform. We also simultaneously live streamed to YouTube, um, much as we're doing for today, where we had uh, a significant increase in attendees as well. And we're currently in the process of editing and uploading the individual talks to YouTube, uh, such that they'll be available for reference in the future. And I would just like to explicitly thank everyone who participated in the Software Development Day. Um, whether you were a speaker or an attendee or both, it was just really lovely to have a chance to talk about these issues um, with the community. And I know that the chat was really active throughout. Um, there were a lot of great resources shared and a lot of great ideas shared. And I think this is the sort of thing we wanna do here today. From the development sprint, so that was a two-day event that took place on Wednesday and Thursday of this week. We had over 65 people register to participate. Um, and in, eventually in the discourse room, we had over 40 people active at a time, which was really exciting. Um, we had 21 pull requests that have been submitted in the past two days, at least as of my last count, um, but it could be even more at this point. There is additional work ongoing, so I know there are a lot of uh, folks who are still working on their pull requests, um, and we're really looking forward to those. I think we've gotten a lot done in just two days and with a, a distributed sprint. I think it's been really impressive, um, and I hope that you'll check out all the work that's went into that. And I just want to explicitly, again, thank everyone who participated in that development sprint. If you didn't get a chance to participate, if it didn't align with your schedule, um, no worries. We always are looking for new contributors, and we'd love for you to stop by and check out the issues um, and let us know if there's something that you'd like to help uh, contribute to Nylon. So for today's event, today is the, uh, as I mentioned, the scientific day. Um, and we'll have six speakers discussing their work on the application of machine learning in neuroscience and neuroimaging. So uh, something that's a bit unique about this day is all of the speakers, um, or almost all of the speakers, will be discussing work that is not done with Nylon, and at least at this point could not be done with Nylon. Uh, but what we're really interested in seeing is to learn a little bit more about uh, the methods that they're proposing, because what we'd really like for the future of Nylon is to always concentrate on finding ways to uh, develop efficient representations of brain imaging data that are still flexible and expressive enough to be able to use in predictive tasks or in statistical modeling tasks um, to relate to features that uh, of cognition and behavior and things that are important to people's lives. Um, so we're really excited to learn more about the work today and to see how we could incorporate uh, a lot of the lessons learned into Nylon in the future. So if you're looking for the exact schedule, the exact schedule is visible on this website um, and that provides the timings for all of these talks. Uh, as well as this introduction. And it also provides links to things uh, like our online town. So if you look at the breaks, those should be hyperlinked. Um, and that provides uh, just a little platform where you can go and engage in a online world 
um, to kind of mimic the experience of coffee at a conference where you can bump into to people and discuss shared research interests, how the talks are going, or just how your day is going. Um, so I'd encourage you to check it out. Uh, the talks will be streamed both on Crowdcast and on YouTube. I'm not sure which one you're watching it on, um, but they should be both available there. If your connection bandwidth allows it, we generally encourage you to use Crowdcast to fully participate in the discussion um, because Crowdcasting allows for several features that are quite useful. So there's a chat along the side. There's also a way to ask questions and upvote questions. And we'll be encouraging the speakers throughout the day to directly take questions uh, from the questions tab. So if you can uh, connect to Crowdcast, I would encourage you to do so. But obviously, if you can't, um, no worries at all. We'd love to see you on YouTube. There's also a chat there. And we'll also try to monitor that as well. With that, I'd like just to give an explicit thanks to all the other members of the organizing team. Um, I happen to be the one who's giving this introduction today, but this is definitely not a one or even a two person uh, event. It's really been so lovely and so wonderful to work with this great team uh, to make this, this whole event happen. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that we can transition to the first talk. Um, so I'm going to pull everyone to the next session and I look forward to seeing you there. Hi again, everyone. I'm just gonna quickly pull the speaker on screen this will give us a bit of time to make sure that we have screen sharing and everything working. Hi, everyone. Hello. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Great. Great. Awesome. So if you just want to share your screen. Yes, absolutely. You might hear a little one as well at some point in the talk. Oh, it's perfect. Um, awesome. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Yes. So I'm going to focus on that. And then, OK. And we have just, this went even more smoothly than I expected. So we have just another minute um, until we, I'll, I'll get you started. Perfect. But thank you so much. My pleasure. So will I be able to see the chat or not? Um, so you should be able, it depends on how you shared your screen, I suppose. Okay. Um, but on the Crowdcast window itself, the chat should still be visible and then uh, what will have what I've noticed will happen is either folks will post explicitly and ask a question or in the chat if you ask, say something with a question mark at the end you can get moved to ask a question um, and things will get upvoted there so if there's anything pressing I yeah. can jump in and let you know Sounds um, but for the most part we'll assume that we can do questions at the end okay perfect well I mean so I think that the second part is really what Gail wanted to see so I think that's <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. We, we need to get up to there. So, <laughs> no, it will be good. I'm I'm really excited for it. Yeah, it's it's an interesting thing doing a different platform, but this one has been I think quite nice. Yeah, um, so okay, so we're at nine fifteen, and it looks like folks have shifted over. Um, so I just want to quickly say I, we're so delighted to have Dr. Sylvia Villeneuve here today. Uh, Dr. Villeneuve is an assistant professor at McGill University in the Department of Psychiatry. She's also an associate member of the Neurology and Neurosurgery Department. Uh, she holds the Canada Research Chair for Early Detection of Alzheimer's Disease. She's a member of the Prevent AD Research Program and an associate member of the McGill Center for Studies in Aging at the Douglas uh, Research Center. And we're so delighted to have her here today to talk about her work predicting functional brain imaging in preclinical Alzheimer's disease. 
Thanks a lot for the introduction. It's really a great pleasure to be here today, and I'm very glad to start this very exciting day, I have to say. Um, so in my lab, what we do, I mean, it's quite an early lab. We started about five years ago, is that we're really interested into trying to identify individuals that will develop Alzheimer's disease dementia. So we know that the disease starts many, many years before people start to express these cognitive symptoms. And if you want to try ways to find ways to try to slow down or stop the disease, we need to be able to identify these individuals, both to put them into clinical trial, because we need to test medication on the one that will eventually develop Alzheimer's disease dementia. And then when we will have, um, hopefully, this medication one day then to be able to give it to people hopefully before they even start to have memory impairment so that would be um, that's kind of the general idea so identifying these individuals that are at increased risk um, of developing Alzheimer's disease dementia. The talk will be divided in a two main section. I will present you actually two projects in which we use machine learning to answer clinical question. And I will spend a little bit more time on the method uh, of the second paper. So if there's things that are not even if the methods are different, there's some redundancy there. So if there's things that are not completely clear in the first method, um, I will walk you through some of these steps again in the second project. So the first one um, was led by Jake Vogel. That is actually, uh, so we met Jake and I when he was a research assistant at Berkeley University when I did my first postdoc. And he's now finishing a PhD with Alan Evan at McGill University. And the second project was led by uh, one of my amazing postdocs that now left the lab to go back to Caen, uh, where she's from. And, um, and in this second project, we developed a model to predict brain age based on functional brain feature. And then the idea was to see in the preclinical phase of the disease, so when people are cognitively normal, can we, um, is there any marker of the disease that accelerated brain aging? Always with this idea that, you know, what we want to do is that we want to try to identify individuals that will develop Alzheimer's disease, dementia, and also, you know, if we could find marker that that make people, let's say, age a little bit less fast, then maybe we would have um, better old age if we want so. Before I dive into these two projects, just that we are all on the same page for those of you that might be less familiar with Alzheimer's disease. So Alzheimer's disease is really a pathological clinical entity. And what that means is that you of course need to have the clinical symptoms, which are usually characterized by um, memory <coughs> loss, but to know that it's really Alzheimer's disease in your brain, you also need to have the pathology. And here we're talking mainly about amyloid plaque and neurofibrillary tangles. And the, um, the hypothetical course of the disease is as follows. So we think that amyloids start in the brain of older adults um, about, and actually I say older adult, but this is false. I will tell you why in a second. But we think that amyloids start in the brain about 20 years before a person will get a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, dementia. And then we think that amyloid leads to the spreading of tau, that tau is neurotoxic. This will impair the brain. And then at one point, people will start expressing mild kind of impairment and eventually when they will not be able to do their activity of daily living then it's when we will give in clinic the diagnosis of Alzheimer's dementia actually we say Alzheimer's disease but it's really when people meet the criteria the more general criteria for dementia um, really meaning that you can you're not autonomous anymore and and really what I want to stress out here is that there's many 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 years happening before we give the diagnosis in clinic so the good news is that we have many years to enter intervene on that disease. The last thing that uh, I want to point your attention to is that there is two main forms of the disease, the sporadic one and then the autosomal dominant one. Sporadic Alzheimer's disease is what we're used to see in clinic. It's these older adults, usually they have 65 years and older, and there is no cause. We don't know the cause of sporadic Alzheimer's disease. We know that the main risk factor is age. Um, having a family history increased the risk of developing dementia by two to threefold. And being a carrier of the APOE for LL also increase your risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. The APOE for LL is not causing Alzheimer's disease, but it's working on different pathways, such as a trans uh, cholesterol transporter. It also helps for the clearance of amyloid. So this gene seems to if you, if you are an equi for a carrier, it will increase your risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. But again, it's not causal. The other form that people know less about, it's uh, less than 1%, it's autosomal dominant Alzheimer's disease or ADAD. And this form of the disease is really interesting because the, um, 
we know the cause. So this, this uh, disease is caused by few genetic mutation. And then when you heritate the genetic mutation from your parent, you will for sure develop the disease. And you usually develop it within your 30, 40, or 50. So way, way earlier than for sporadic Alzheimer's disease. In the talk, I will talk about many cohort, but the two main ones are the prevent AD cohort and then the Diane cohort. The prevent AD cohort is a cohort of, uh, that is based at McGill University. We are following about 350 participants that are cognitively normal at the entry, were cognitively normal. We have only, we have less than 10% that develop cognitive impairment or dementia throughout the longitudinal follow-up. We started the court in 2011. Actually, John Breitner started the court. I was not yet at Middle University. Um, and then, sorry about that. And then the, um, NL, so the, and this is really, and, and so we're really targeting individuals that we uh, believe are at increased risk of progressing to Alzheimer's disease dementia. The other court is the Diane court. It's a court um, following individual with ADAD. The main core of the court is based at Washington University, but given the rarity of these individuals, the, um, uh, there are many site recruiting or testing these individuals. One of them is at McGill University also. One of the most famous um, paper uh, related to autosomal dominant Alzheimer's disease, and this is important because the, um, this years to estimated symptom onset that I will describe in one second is what we try to predict in our first predictive model that, that was conducted by uh, Jake Vogel. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so in individual autosomal dominant Alzheimer's disease, as I told you, if you have the genetic mutation, you will develop the disease. Um, and then we know about when you will develop the disease. So you should develop the disease about at the age at which your parent developed the disease. So let's say that your mother had the genetic mutation. She developed the disease when she was 30 years old and you are 20 years old, then you are 10 years away to develop the disease. So on that graph, if you look at the x-axis, you would be minus 10 and so on. And then so they use in that paper cross-sectional data to put every individual on this scale of how far they are from the age of onset of their parent, their parent, or what we call years to estimated symptom onset. And what they did is that they looked at the different trajectory of the different biomarker. So every line here represents a biomarker of Alzheimer's disease. So for example, uh, we have um, cerebrospinal fluid, amyloid beta, the yellow line, that we think is about one of the markers that we can capture first, as being abnormal within these individuals. And we think that this biomarker is abnormal about um, 20 years before the, their expected symptom onset. Again, we would love to do that using predictive model and then using national data, but these data don't exist yet. We're working on acquiring them. So one of the first thing that we did um, when I arrived at Middle University looking at the Preventative Court is that we asked the question, well, is this a relationship between the age of the person and then the age of the parent that here we call years to estimated symptom onset, is, is, this, is this related to any biomarker in the prevent AD cord? And then what we found is a weak um, but significant relationship between estimated years of onset and abnormal level of amyloid within the uh, CSF cerebral spinal fluid. Um, when we saw that, we said, well, you know, it's not that strong, so let's ask for other cord. We replicated that finding in other small samples. And a few years later, now we have PET imaging in a subset of that cord. We replicated the finding again using PET. But, you know, the, 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 the association is there, but you know, is it strong enough to say that if you have someone in front of you in clinic, you will use that score to try to, you know, predict how abnormal the amyloid is in the brain of that person? Looking at that graph, well, I mean, I don't think so. I wouldn't trust doing that. So we also found association between this estimated years to symptom onset and some functional and brain um, feature. And then what we decided to do, because we had more participants, is that we decided to try to create a predictive model to see um, can we can we actually create, let's say, a brain signature and then predict um, this estimated years of symptom onset based really on functional resting state data and then structural data. And then to walk you um, 
quickly through the, the processing method, what we did is that we, we took all the resting state data, pre-processed them uh, using YAC, then uh, segmented the brain in 443 cortical region, from which we extracted time series um, in each of these region, and then we created a correlation matrix for every single participant. Um, for the structural MRI, so we segmented the brain using STM12, and then um, just process them using kind of a regular VDM pipeline in order to get probably probably map. And then really the outcome here is really that we, ex you know, based on that, we extracted gray matter volume in these 443 um, cortical region. And the important part here is that what we did is that we use these now 887, because we include also the total intragranular volume, these 80, 887 brain feature as our predictor in our model. So we build a predictive model based on these functional and then these structural brain feature. Um, out of about uh, 250 participants, we add 200 six participants that pass all the QC for both modalities. We were not dealing with missing data here. And then what we did is that we split the, our sample into a training set to build a model and then into a test set. So as for the training sets, we did a threefold um, cross-validation approach. So, and really, really what is important here is that, you, you know, like you, you take all your data and then you decide to um, really to cook, to to build your model just in part of your data set. So this is this training set here. And then, um, and then the technique that we use to build our predictive model is a lasso regression. Um, and then at the end of the day, so we build three different uh, models based on our training set data. And then what we did for our final model is that we averaged the weight of all the three uh, folder, the three model. Um, and this is what we apply to the unseen data. And one thing that I didn't mention here, but another step that we did is that in the final model, we're really only keeping the feature that were significantly associated with years to estimated uh, symptom onset, trying to have a model that is as simple as possible. Now to the results. So again, we did that in two thirds of the court and then for the one third that we didn't touch. So now I'm presenting you uh, when we are testing the model. So what you see here, I guess that the the axis should have been um, changed, but then, so what you're seeing here on the X axis is the predicted years of onset and on the Y axis are the real data. So the real years to estimated onset. And when I say the real data, again, it's just this calculation of the age of the parent. Um, so actually the age of the person minus the age of the parent. So this is what we're talking about here. And this model, even if not perfect, because if you look at the correspondence uh, between the number themselves, it's a little bit off, but still we're explaining 22% of the variance. And then in general, what we can conclude from that is that the more you express this um, brain signature that I'm showing here, um, then the closer you are to the age of onset of your parents. And when we look at the feature that were included in the final model, well, we were reassured because um, for those of us working with Alzheimer's disease, the, these brain regions are often found to be impaired early in the course of the disease. So if we look, for example, at the resting state um, functional um, feature that were kept in the model, well, I mean, we have brain regions such as the hippocampus, the angular gyrus, and the pecunius, so all brain regions that are, no, are extremely vulnerable um, at, in the, at early stages in the course of the disease. And then, of course, you know, the real question is, well, it's good, you know, like we use these fancy technique, but is that better than what we have in clinic? So if we what do we have in clinic to try to, to to try to predict who will progress Alzheimer's disease dementia? Well, often we have demographic information. So in this case, uh, we're talking about you know maybe preclinical sporadic Alzheimer's disease, so the age of the person. Um, we have uh, family history in this case. We have cognitive score mm -hmm. in the um, here to to compute kind of a clinical model. We also use APOE for information, which is not always available in clinic, and then the hippocampal volume. And then the idea of that, this figure that I'm showing you is to ask the question, was our predictive model 
better at predicting years to estimated onset um, than another model that would have been built using a similar technique, but then in this case uh, would have been built only using the clinical information that we have in clinic. And the answer is yes. So our model will be here a uh, model one, and then the clinical model will be represented as model two. And you can see that our model outperformed the clinical model. Now, if we put both information together, which is a little bit intuitively what I would have done as a clinician, um, then the variance a little is a little bit better. So this is model three, but it's not statistically better than the brain signature that we developed, so model one. And then of course, you know, like you might think, well, this is great, but this is kind of, at the end of the day, you're just predicting how far you are from the age of onset of your parent. So we, Jake, look very hard in the field for data, longitudinal data in which some individual would have progressed um, to malfunction impairment or dementia throughout the course of the disease. These data don't really exist. There are only a few of them. Um, and then he found 26 individuals from the ADNI cohort. This is an open access cohort in which we had these individuals that through the course of the, um, the longitudinal follow-up, they started by being completely normal and then convert to uh, have cognitive impairment. And what we're seeing here is that if we apply our or predictive model, these brain feature, then we're able to predict um, how far people are from the the progression. And actually, what I just said is a little bit wrong. We should maybe borrow a phrase it because, of course, there's some error in that model in the way that the more you express these brain, this brain signature, if you want to, then uh, the closer you are to really disease progression. So to conclude for this first uh, part of the talk, um, so I show you that, so in individual with uh, autosomal dominant Alzheimer's disease, we know when people will, should develop the disease because that should be about at the age of onset of their parent. The first main finding that we found in the preventative was really that this association might also be present um, in sporadic Alzheimer's disease. And this is kind of um, a big finding because, you know, not everyone in the preventative will progress to Alzheimer's dementia. So even though if this relationship is far from being perfect, it's still quite strong because we are, because while having some non-progressors, some individuals that are not in the preclinical phase of the disease in the prevent AD, we're adding really a lot of noise to our data set. So if we find this relationship and then we found it using a correlation with AMWID in different sample and then using predictive model, uh, looking at structural and then functional brain feature, and probably even more importantly, uh, we're using a completely different data set and then asking a little bit a more different research question, which is really eventually what we're trying to get at, who will convert and when, then this model was working. Now, before I conclude really on this first section, I just want to do a little plug-in. Um, so the, we are working very hard with um, the Canadian Open Platform Initiative, so Jeannie Pauline, Alan Evan, to put the Prevent AD data open access. It is a long process. Uh, it took about a year just to reconsent most of the participants. If you look at the openpreventad.loris.ca website, you can find MRI and sonographic information about on about two participants. We are um, working on putting more data available, so more participants and also uh, more, um, more information there because right now it's just the demographic and eventually the um, soon hopefully the AMLED PET and TAU data on a subsample will also be put there with some NIC data. Okay, so second project. So all the project that we do in the lab, we do it really in a collaborative way because in the lab we have individuals that are that have a lot of skills in method, and then um, we also have individuals that are more clinician, for instance. So the um, and actually, so when I say in the lab, it's the lab and then outside of the lab because one person that uh, advised us on uh, the, the two project on the method part is it's in Bachelon Presso, and he's actually a, a faculty at McGill University as well. So in this second project, the idea was really to build a model of brain age that worked across lifespans. So that was the first challenge and based on functional brain feature. And why functional brain feature? Well, it's because we think that 
we might be able in the preclinical phase of the disease to capture functional change before structural change. And then the second part of that project was really to test, um, are there, uh, is amyloid and then some genetic variant related to accelerated brain aging? And this project was led by Gilles Gonon, again, um, so a previous postdoc in the lab. This idea of building a model of brain age um, is something that I wanted to do for many, many years with this idea that I've always been intrigued by the fact that not all everyone seemed to age at the same pace. So it's very impressive when you have someone in clinic in front of you that is seven years old, but look physically, but also cognitively, just like if we were like 50 years old. Well, just after that person, you have another person with the same age, and then this new person look way, 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 way older. And often when you do the cognitive testing, this person look on the test is way worse as well. And in fact, they have been some twin study where they looked at twins, and then the one they asked people to rate the, the age of the person uh, based on the wrinkles and things like that. And then the twins that was looking older often had more cognitive impairment. And in the Lostal study, the twin that was looking older was dying, uh, had higher chances to die in the course uh, of the longitudinal study. So really suggesting that, you know, uh, we have our biological age, so when, sorry, we have our chronological age, so when we were born, but this biological aging, how fast do our organ age, this seems to be uh, important in order to uh, live well longer. To give you an example, um, so uh, here are uh, two brain of, individual from the prevent AD study that have about the same age, both are cognitively normal. And then what you can see is that the person on the upper part have a brain that look way younger than the person on the lower part. On the lower part, there is a lot of atrophy for those of you who are not used to read these scan. If you look just at the size of the ventricle, I mean, the ventricle are really way larger. And then there's also more atrophy within um, the temporal lobe. And, uh, and so in order to target this question of chronological versus biological aging, few labs, or actually more and more labs in the world, have developed model of brain age. Um, and then these predictive models usually uh, use structural feature, feature, sorry, in uh, our project that I'm going to present, we decided to go with functional feature again because we think that they might be earlier marker of Alzheimer's disease. And what the literature is suggesting is that if you have Alzheimer's dementia, malcognitive impairment or other condition, often you will show accelerated brain aging. Here is one study that I want to give you a little bit more example about. I think it's very interesting for the topic of the talk. So if you look at the panel on the left, um, you the, the the groups are split into cognitively normal individual, individual with mild cognitive impairment that are again split in two based on who works were stayed stable throughout the course of the study. It was longitudinal study, and then who through the course of the study progress to uh, Alzheimer's dementia. And then the final group is this group of individuals with Alzheimer's dementia. And then what they're showing here is that even at baseline, when everyone in the group of stable or progressor MCI were considered as having mild cognitive impairment, the one that eventually progressed to Alzheimer's dementia were already showing accelerated brain aging when compared to stable MCI. So suggesting that maybe this accelerated brain aging is a biomarker of uh, disease progression. And what you're showing on the right, um, what, I'm, what I'm showing here on the right is a paper from the same group that worked a lot on that topic in the field of Alzheimer's disease. And then again, you know, they, they are showing that individual with um, mild cognitive impairment, so the progressor of Alzheimer's dementia are showing accelerated brain aging over time. And then what this figure is adding is that if you are a carrier of the E4 allele, so again, this genetic risk factor for the sporadic form of the disease, then your brain is even aging even faster. So it's kind of a two-hit effect. So you have the disease that make your brain age faster over time, and then be having this APOE4 allele also accelerate this brain aging. 
Now, really, the research question that we will target in a second is, well, what about if you look at cognitively normal individuals? Can we see accelerated brain aging related to Alzheimer's disease a risk or causal factor? And, you know, that question might look trivial because you think, oh, well, you know, like they already did it in the NCI and then so on and so on. And then why always targeting to these little individuals? Well, there is about one third of older adults um, adult that are aged 65 years and older that are walking down the street with a brain full of amyloid. So, um, you know, targeting really these individuals and then trying to stop the disease is probably not that trivial. So for the first part um, that I will show you is really how did we um, develop the model. And uh, again, it's important to stress the fact that we wanted a model that spanned across life, so not just an older adult, which would probably have been easier to do. And this idea is because we want to also test some association within the Diane study. And as I told you before, these individuals are way younger. Um, so we add after QC and things like that, we, we grab data from many uh, different data sets. And then for the project, the final data set on which we created and tested the model was 1,340 individuals. And then what we did in a set and the first step is that we split the data into three groups. So the training set was really used to build the model. And then after that, to make sure that we were not overfitting the model, we used the validation set. And I will walk you through that in more detail in a second. And then only when the model was final, we passed actually month developing the model. And only when the model was final, we, um, what we said we called open the envelope and then test our, if, if our model was working in the test set, but also test our research question within the test set. And we never tweaked back the test set. We just worked with what we have, and this is what will be eventually published. It's in preprint right now. To walk you quickly uh, through the methods, so the scan again, so now we only have resting state uh, fMRI in our predictive model. They were processed again using YAC. We use a different parcellation, so we use the Peterson, uh, the Power and Peterson atlas, um, and we extracted uh, time series within each of these parcels. Now we're talking about 239 nodes created again uh, correlation matrices for every participant. And from these correlation matrices, we computed using the brain connectivity toolbox, um, uh, 26 uh, graph metrics. And then before um, developing our um, neural network, we did a first step in which we looked at actually all of the 26 graph metrics and try to predict using a support vector machine and then also um, a regression tree assemble, which, which of these features might actually be the best, the best predictor of chronological age. And I will spend a little bit more time on that within the next slide. But the idea was just to have a general idea in order to rank the feature by whom would be the best predictor to feed them first in the model. And then after that, um, we use MATLAB to build the neural network. And here, how to read the model, it's really that the input are the 26 graph metrics. So here in this example, we are putting uh, five, the five graph metrics in the model. And then the output is really this um, chronological age that we're trying to predict. And then, so I mean, um, this was not done with Nylearn, but there's many, many steps uh, that you can um, that you can do using uh, Nylearn function that are here in orange. Okay, so if we spend a little bit more time on the architecture of that network, um, so here would be an example of the simplest model that we created. So. Five feature, again, these are five uh, graph theory metrics. And then with one hidden layer, that is composed of five nodes. And again, we want to try to predict the output that is chronological age. And the way we decided in uh, that uh, study to assess the validity of the model was by looking at the root mean square error. And so the more error, the worst uh, is the model. So if you do a very, very simple model, I mean, it kind of makes sense. I mean, you will add a little bit more error. Now, the best model for this um, in our training set would have been a very complex model. And again, it kind of makes sense because the, the more precise the model, the more complex the model, the better it will be at, um, you know, predicting the, the age in your participant in which you're building the model. However, the problem with that, if you take this very specified um, 
model to your training set is that it's not going to be generalizable to another data set. So it's what we call overfitting. So it's why here we took a different data set. Um, it could have been a subset of the different data set, but here we really decided to go with a completely independent data set that was also uh, that had individual crossing the lifespan. And then what we did is that we, we test actually the, the generalizability of our training set within this new data set. And again, what you can see here is that if your model is too complex, it's just not going to work. So to define our final model, and then this is the model that will be used in the set, next step when we will test more the clinical question. So we decided to go with the model that was the best generalizable. And this would be in this case, so 10 feature and then two hidden layer. And, you know, I told you um, in the previous slide that we did this uh, feature ranking first. Well, the idea was really that if you start by feeding the model with the feature that have the most chances to predict age, you will have a more simpler model. If you don't do that and then you just enter the feature randomly, your model will be way more complex and probably it's going to be more difficult to generalize it. So we think that this first tweak was probably a good implementation. Now to the results, I mean, in the training set. So, I mean, this is, I guess, less exciting because we, you know, we use this training set to train the models. So of course, it should work. Um, so what we're seeing is that we're explaining 53% of the variance. What is probably more impressive is that the, the mean root square error is quite low. At least we were very happy about that. And again, you know, it's a model that is spanning cross lifespan, so not that easy to uh, implement. If we look at the validation set, so unseen data, data that were not used to train the model, again, it's working extremely well, um, explaining about 50% of the variance, and again, a very little, um, according to my understanding, though error. And then now, if we, when we open the envelope, so again, like this is completely unseen data, and then we're not deciding how generalizable is that model. It's really kind of, we are looking at that model for the first time. And we did that again, you know, like a few months after we started the project when everything was done, but we were quite happy about uh, the results. So we're explaining 36% of the variance. Of course, you can see that some data sets, just as the prevent AD are a little bit overestimated in terms of age, but overall, you know, for a model on which we never, never, never tweaked um, based on previous data, we were quite happy. And to the last part um, of this talk, so the last question was really to test um, if this predicted age model um, differences, so difference between predicted brain age and then chronological age, um, was associated with genetic factor or amyloid factor. Um, these are the characteristic of the individual of interest that were included in the test set. And of course, the main difference between both cohorts is that the prevent AD participants are way older by definition because they're at risk of spreading Alzheimer's disease. In order to test our hypothesis, what we did is that for individual in the Diane cohort, we split the group as based on the one that do have a genetic mutation versus the one that don't have a genetic mutation. And then in the prevent AD, we split the group based on the one that have one or two APOE4 allele versus the one that didn't have APOE4 allele. So yeah, they were APOE33, for example, or 32 or so on. And um, for the amyloid, so we pre-process the scan um, using a quite standard method where we use an MRI that we co-register to the PET scan in order to define some region of interest. And then uh, we extract um, standardized uptake values ratio within a lot of brain region because we know that when amyloid is there in the brain, it's pretty much distributed in a lot of brain region, and um, and we use the old cerebellum as the reference region because the, if you just look at kind of the raw uh, pet binding data, well, you will have, the, the, the tracer will bind to things that will not be amyloid, so usually we normalize by a reference region to really try to extract only or mostly the signal related to amyloid in the brain, and we use the old cerebellum to, um, to do that because it's a brain region where we don't, usually there is no amyloid there, at least not in the first stage of the disease. And um, we add different tracer within our two um, cohort. And you know, like 
10 years ago, that for me would have been a big limitation. And I would have spent time in the paper discussing about that, you know. And then now the way that I see that is that if you can build a predictive model and then it works, you know, when changing the data set, when changing the tracer, when changing sometimes a little bit the region that you're targeting and things like that, it means that it's probably generalizable. And if you want to try to build a model that you can import in the clinic, you need to have something that is a little bit messy because clinic is not messy, but it's it's a, you know it's challenging to predict something in real life. Um, so for me, you know, now dealing with the core that have different tracer and things like that, it's it's a good thing and then not a bad thing. So the mentality um, is changing in the field. Now going to the results. Um, so in the Diane study, so we found that individual with a mutation carrier, so individual that we know will develop Alzheimer's disease, dementia. Um, and in that study, again, we only included cognitively normal older adults. So their brain was um, predicted as being older when compared to non-mutation carrier. In the prevent AD cohort, uh, we didn't found uh, an effect of APOE4 um, on this um, predicted age uh, signature or model. And when when we saw these results, I mean, of course, I was 100% sure that this, this finding in the mutation carrier was influenced by the fact that some of them already have amyloid in their brain. You know, we think that amyloid is the first, the first marker starting in the course of the disease. So I was really sure that amyloid was driving this effect. And I was extremely, extremely surprised when I saw that it was not the case. So here, when we split the group of mutation carrier based on the one that don't have amyloid and then the one that have amyloid, the one that don't have amyloid that is uh, in the middle here in the lower panel, they also have this accelerated, sorry, brain aging. So suggesting that it's not necessarily amyloid that is causing uh, that finding. Um, and then again, in the prevent AD, no association with amyloid. And then because we were quite surprised about that finding, um, we decided to look at amyloid as a continuous variable. So looking at an association between this predicted age difference and amyloid as a continuous variable, really asking the question, well, maybe, I don't know, like the one with high, high level of amyloid will drive this association. And again, it was not the case. So to conclude on uh, this last part uh, of the talk, so we were able to create a model of um, brain age based on functional feature. The one, the individual with autosomal dominant Alzheimer's disease that were a mutation carrier, they had accelerated brain aging compared to the non-mutation carrier. And if you're asking your question, who are the non-mutation carrier? Well, it's just that when you enter that study, you need to have a parent with autosomal dominant Alzheimer's disease. If you heritate from the gene, you are in the mutation carrier group. If you don't heritate from the gene, then for sure you're not in the preclinical phase of Alzheimer's disease because you're too young. So you're in the non-mutation. Uh, carrier group. So a perfect group control actually. And then uh, this association was not accounted for for amyloid in the brain of the mutation carrier. If we go back to this hypothetical model, um, I mean it challenges it and what it suggests is that maybe actually in fact um, differences or change in resting state functional connectivity happier prior to amyloid deposition. And if you want to know or read more about that topic, there is a nice review by um, Bill Jagus and Beth Marmino on that topic, where they talk about a lot of, uh, actually not a lot, but a few studies that have done in rodent suggesting that um, the um, abnormal brain activity might actually lead to the accumulation of amyloid. And as a General conclusion, so um, it's um, so predictive model can be used to answer a clinical question. And my best advice for those of you clinicians that want to do that is start with your question. Don't try to build a predictive model. Just start with a clinical question. And then after, you know, instead of doing a simple regression or like a correlation, ask the question, can I answer this question? Do I have enough sub subject to try to build a model and then see if I can you know, predict uh, my outcome. So I think this is probably the best way and the simplest way to start. In order to build these predictive models, you need a lot of data to train the model, and then you also need an independent test set to test your model and be sure that your model is generalizable. And really, this is what we want eventually in clinic.
Given the increased number of data sets that are open in the field of Alzheimer's disease, building predictive model on Alzheimer's disease is more and more feasible. However, if you want to do that, I mean, the, um, it's still extremely challenging because Alzheimer's disease is an heterogeneous disease by nature, which is fun to build predictive model, but that also means that you need a ton of data to have a model that will really fit the heterogeneity of what you're trying to target as an outcome. And then the other thing is that reviewer will often ask you to kind of, you know, you launch data, for example, or something like that to validate your finding. And as for now, these data don't really exist. So it's really the main challenge that we have at the moment um, while building model on Alzheimer's disease. So with that, I thank you all for your attention. A special thank to uh, Jake, Julie, that leaded the first project. It's Anne that helped us with all the analysis. Uh, Alex as well, that really built the, the brain age predictive model. And Alexa that uh, helped uh, throughout uh, all these different projects, and actually all the projects in the lab. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was a really lovely talk. Uh, okay, so I think we have time for maybe one question. There's, uh, oh no, there are two questions in the Ask a Questions tab. Um, so either if you'd like, uh, maybe you could answer one or you could try and address both quickly. Um, if it's easy, I can read out maybe what the questions are. Read them and then, yeah. And then Perfect. if you have a question, just please send me an email and I'll answer them. Perfect, thank you. Okay, so maybe the first question then would be, have you considered uh, how the correlation with brain signatures may differ pre and post al Alzheimer's disease onset? Sorry, say it again. So if I, I was trying to read them, but I cannot find that. Could oh, you no, it's, I'm, I'm missing now. <laughs> no, it's fine. So the question was, have you considered how the correlation with brain signatures may differ pre and post Alzheimer's disease onset? Yeah, absolutely. So what happened with all disease, uh, Alzheimer's disease onset is that, of course, like the brain signature would be way more important. But I think that at one point, because all the brain is so destroyed, I think, you know, there would be kind of this curve where at first the brain signature is hard to implement, like it's, it's hard to find it, right? And then after that, the, the more the disease progressed and the more people will express it. And then at one point, after the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, dementia, my guess is that the brain is kind of so so atrophied at that point, so messy, that maybe then it's kind of harder again to find this brain signature. But this is just, you know, a thought, but something to be tested for sure. No, no, I think I think that's really, I think that's a, a promising perhaps area for sure to think about. Um, okay, I, I just wanna say there are a few more questions, but I don't think we'll have time to get to them. I will make sure they get to you. But thank you so much again. This was a really lovely talk and I really appreciated it. All right, so I will, I will close this broadcast and I will see everyone in the next session. Thank you so much. Thanks. Hello everyone. All right, I'm just going to invite our speaker on stage. Hello. Hello. Is the sound working? Yes. Okay. I can Perfect. Okay. I'm gonna um, start the PowerPoint and then share my screen. I think that's the right order. I think so. I think that would be perfect. <laughs> Sorry, it's slightly different with every software, so. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. Um, so I'm gonna turn on the pointer and then I think we're good to go. Nice, all right, so I'm gonna focus the screen on you, on the on your slides rather. Um, okay, perfect. And then I just wanna quickly introduce, uh, we're so delighted to have Dr. Carson Stringer today. So uh, Dr. Stringer is a group leader at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute uh, Genalia Research Campus. She did her postdoctoral work there with Marius Pachitariu and Carl Svoda 
Um, and she previously did her PhD work at the University College London uh, with Kenneth Harris. And today we'll be hearing a little bit from her about her work on raster map, which is a manifold embedding algorithm for large scale, high dimensional data. So thanks so much for being here. Thanks, thanks for having me. Um, I have the, the Crowdcast open on another screen. Wait, can you hear me? Yes, 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 yes. Sorry, I have the Crowdcast open on another screen, so I should be able to see questions, but also I'll let you moderate too. Perfect, yeah, and if there's, uh, if you wanna stop, we can, uh, you can stop at any point for questions, but I can, if there's anything super pressing, I'll let you know, like if your sound cuts out or something. Cool, thanks. Okay, so I'm interested in how the brain encodes the visual world and how it internally represents behaviors. So to understand how neurons work together to build these types of representations, we need to record many neurons. So I've worked uh, on developing tools to record thousands of neurons simultaneously in the mouse brain. And so I'll tell you a little bit about those tools and then I'll describe kind of the scientific results we found with this large scale data. In particular, that neural responses to visual stimuli were high dimensional. And then also, now that we know that the, the structure of neural activity is high dimensional, uh, we developed an algorithm that exploits the structure called raster map uh, to be able to visualize uh, large scale data. So to record uh, many thousands of neurons in mice, so you make a, you basically make a small window here in the mouse skull. And this, um, I know you're fMRI people, so I'll just say quickly, this is kind of a, a chronic prep. So the, the mice live with this little hole and we record many days. So they live the rest of their life like this and it's not too mean. Um, so basically we're able to record using this technique called calcium imaging with a microscope over this little hole. And uh, these neurons are expressing uh, proteins that light up when calcium comes into the cell. And so you can see these cells lighting up here. So that's when they're firing. So that's what one of these recordings looks like. And so a lot, many people just record from maybe one plane, one field of view, but we zoom out and we record from many planes simultaneously in depth through, through the mouse brain. And so we're able to, there's a trade-off, we're only able to record at three hertz, but that's uh, sufficient for the types of questions that we're trying to answer. So what does this large scale data look like? So here's, I'm gonna show a video on the right of the data. Uh, each of these squares is one of these planes in depth. And then this upper square uh, in the upper left is the, the image that's being flashed on the screen in front of the mouse at the same time. And then you can see what the mouse is doing down here. So it's free to run on a ball, you'll see. So you can see these neurons firing in response to these stimuli. Uh, in particular, you'll see how much the brain lights up relative to spontaneous activity when there's no stimuli coming in. So these microscopes are relatively standard, uh, but there weren't uh, fast and accurate processing pipelines for this kind of data. Most people were sort of circling ROIs manually. So we created a pipeline called Sweet2P, which extracts these neurons simult uh, uh, quickly and accurately from, from these neural recordings. So that's how we're able to get these simultaneous recordings of many thousands of neurons. And so each of these little uh, colored circles is, is a mask for a single cell. And then to compute the activity over time, uh, you take the sum of those pixels inside that mask and, and so that intensity across time, and then you get traces like this for each of these neurons. So this is the, the type of, of data that we're working with now. So it's gonna be neurons by time or neurons by visual stimuli. So, so now we wanted to ask the question, now we have these large scale recordings with the many thousands of neurons, what is the dimensionality of neural responses to visual stimuli. And this is an important question because there's different functional consequences of, of how the brain processes the external world depending on whether or not its representations are high or low dimensional. So in the visual system, you have some image that's shown on the screen and then it comes into your retina, which you can think of as just being a bunch of fancy post-processing filters. And then it goes through to the thalamus and then from the thalamus to the visual cortex, there's, there's basically 50 times more neurons, at least in the visual cortex, representing this, the external stimulus than there are in the thalamus. So there's this expansion of the signal. So there's two uh, possible hypotheses for why there's this expansion of the single signal. One of them is that the, each of these 
the thalamic neurons, for instance, maybe drive 100 uh, visual cortical neurons, and they all do the same thing together. So you have these groups of many neurons doing the same thing. And this is a, a low dimensional code. Um, but it's, so it doesn't represent many visual features, but it's robust to noise that, that might be in the circuit. And then another hypothesis would be that responses are instead uh, high dimensional, that all these neurons are coding different visual features and there's kind of an expansion uh, of the space in visual cortex. And so that might have an advantage that it might make it easier to, in, to build downstream decoders uh, of, of the world, for instance, to classify whether or not this is a tiger um, if you have this high dimensional representation rather than this low dimensional representation. So to quantify dimensionality, uh, we're going to use the eigenvalues of the system. So I'll explain to you what eigenvalues are. So we have this matrix of many neurons by stimuli and we show 2,800 stimuli to the mice uh, and we show them twice. So we, we're actually doing a cross-validated technique to get to do the principal components, but I'm not gonna go into how that works. You can ask me about it offline. Um, so we're gonna do principal components to get the eigenvalues. So we have, here's an example of how principal components work. So we're gonna take the first, let's say we take the first three rows in this matrix. So these are neurons one, two, and three. Each of these dots is a single column in this, in this matrix. So this represents uh, the firing of these three neurons to a single stimulus. And then we, you can imagine we have many more of these axes, but just in, in 3D, we can draw the principal components of the responses to these stimuli. And so the top three principal components look like this, where the top principal component is this direction where the neural responses vary the most across this set of stimuli. PC2 has the second most amount of variance, and then PC3 has the third most, and so on, and you can, and you can extract these principal components from, from the neural data. So these, uh, e the, the lengths of these principal components are the variances, uh, are variances basically uh, how much the, the neural activity varies across these, these axes, and those are the eigenvalues of the system. So we're going to basically make a plot of variance as a function of PC dimension as we go down one PC2, three, and so on. And so for instance, for a low dimensional system, you would get an eigenvalue spectrum that looks something like this, where you have five principal components, say, or maybe even three that are significant, and then the rest are zero. So this is, a, this is an example where you can kind of fit your system. Maybe you have thousands of neurons, but you can fit it into kind of like a three dimensional box uh, and explain all the activity with just kind of three dimensions. You could alternatively have a high dimensional system where the eigenvalue spectrum would then be flat, where every, there, all of these directions have lower variance, but the, it means that the system is exploring many of these different directions and you can't explain the system by putting it into a little box. So I'll give you two examples of a low dimensional and a high dimensional code to kind of make this more clear. So an example of a, a low dimensional code would be uh, these uh, tuning curves here, these wide tuning curves where this is a one dimensional stimulus and we have the responses of each of these neurons which are colored in different colors. And this is a, this is a low dimensional code where there's only two eigenvalues which are significant and then the rest are zero. And if we take a random projection of this neural activity, so we just take three dimensions out of the thousand uh, neurons that we have, then we get something along the stimulus dimension that's like a circle. So we, we just basically, if we move a little bit in stimulus space, the, the representation doesn't change very much. It changes smoothly because we have these wide tuning curves. So as, you, as one neuron starts to slowly turn off, another one turns on and you move slowly through the stimulus space. And this will make you more robust to noise. Uh, alternatively, you could have something like a high dimensional code where this in this case is a sparse high dimensional code where every neuron is coding for a different stimulus. So each neuron is one of these spikes here that codes for a different stimulus. And th then this gives a variance spectrum that's flat. So every single eigenvector in this system is actually a different neuron and they each have equal variance because each of the neurons has an equal firing rate uh, in, in response to its own stimulus. And then if you look at this random projection, you get something like a spiky ball, because if you move any small amount in the stimulus space, the representation completely changes. A totally different neuron is encoding your stimulus. So this is a system that's not robust to noise, but might have more precision in terms of coding for the stimulus with these very sharp tuning curves. Uh, so many studies in the past in neuroscience have concluded that neural activity is low dimensional. 
Um, but these studies were limited in terms of the number of stimuli they showed and also the number of neurons recorded. So now we, we have um, the ability to record this many neurons and show many stimuli. So we're going to try to answer this question in our large scale data and see what is the eigenspectrum of these neural responses. And what we found was that the neural eigenspectrum was, was neither of these. It, didn't, it doesn't look like it's a few values and then goes to zero. It also didn't look like a flat line. What we found instead was that the eigenspectrum decayed like a power law of one over n and to the alpha where alpha is one. So this is approximately one over n. So this is a high dimensional code. We can't fit this code into a box. Um, but it's also not a flat, de totally decorrelated code. These neurons also co-vary together uh, within this stimulus space. So for instance, a majority of stimuli are going to kind of activate the neurons along these top principal components. And then there will be uh, subgroups of stimuli that kind of drive these smaller principal components of, of the neural activity. And, and, this, uh, and I'll show you an example of a 1D model with a power law so you can kind of get an idea of what this might look like. So if we, this is an example of a 1D model that has this eigenspectrum. And what you can see is it's, you're still able to move along this 1D space and you have this, this uh, maintain, this, it maintains this, this global structure kind of, but you're still, you have these kind of finer scale details that are able to be represented with these higher uh, principal components that are non-zero. Whereas in the case of, of a low dimensional code, you don't have any um, weight in those principal components. So you're so what we what we think of uh, this this power law eigenspectrum is doing is it's kind of balancing two uh, two goals uh, of of the neural code. So one co one uh, goal is to have as much cap capacity as possible. You want to encode as much information about the visual world as possible, uh, and and this will make it easier for downstream decoders to be able to kind of pull various features that they want to use to to do computations. Um, but at the same time, you don't want to be so high dimensional and, and sparse and decorrelated like this, this code where you lose your smoothness of the representation of the visual world. So uh, an example of, of a code that, that kind of doesn't have the smoothness would be like a deep neural network that's susceptible to adversarial attacks, if you've heard of those. So you change a single pixel and then the, uh, the network might say that this is a, a, a different species like it's a fish instead of a cat and so you these are these are examples of, of networks that aren't robust to these small perturbations but ideally the brain is robust to these kinds of small perturbations where you change a pixel in your visual field hopefully your perception of the world doesn't change so we think kind of neural neural activity is kind of in this sweet spot between being as high dimensional as possible while still maintaining smooth representations um, so I'm just gonna stop briefly here and if anyone wants to ask questions about this part before I move on to how we visualize this type of data. I think I can see a question here. Um, oh, sorry, that's from before. All right, if, if we're good, then I'm just gonna keep moving. Uh, so there, uh, so, okay, sorry, I got a, a thumbs up. Okay, so there are other types of high dimensional data that also have this power law decay. So uh, it's not just stimulus driven activity, this example of, of neural uh, responses driven by these visual stimuli. Uh, there's also spontaneous activity, which is activity we record in the absence of, of external visual stimuli. Those, that activity also decays as a power law. Uh, additionally, uh, zebrafish whole brain activity. So this is, this is many thousands of neurons recorded in the zebrafish brain. The, that activity also has this power law eigenspectrum. And then uh, natural images, uh, they, have a, uh, uh, they also have a, a power law eigenspectrum. And, and this has kind of been well documented in the past. They have this, this feature of self-similarity. So these lower eigenvalues their eigenvectors are similar to the eigenvectors in these higher PCs. And so when you zoom in, you see kind of the same thing as you zoom into the image. Um, and then the 
uh, English language, if you look at correlations between words within sentences, that, that matrix also has power law decay. And then also social networks have this power law decay. Uh, so I see a question. Um, if you're recording from multiple retinotopic fields, how might this contribute to the dimensionality estimates? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, and what we found is that if you put two receptive field uh, areas that are two areas that have different receptive fields together, then the power law actually becomes a bit flatter. So it, it's not as um, you're, you're exploring more dimensions in, in a sense of, of the neural space uh, than you would be if you're just recording from a single retinotopic field. So uh, does that kind of make sense? Uh, okay, I, I'm just gonna keep keep going because I, I think there's a bit of a, a lag with my computer looking at the question. Okay, so um, so what we want to do is be able to visualize this high dimensional activity that that we've seen. Um, yes, impact of noise is a is a is a great question, and so that's why we've actually we developed a technique to be able to try to avoid, um, try to get rid of the impact of noise. And, and our technique is basically, you need to have at least two repeats of each response to the, to the same visual stimulus. And then you do a cross-validated principal components method where you take the eigenvalue, the eigenvectors from one set of responses, and then you compute the singular values or the eigenvalues after you project the data into those eigenvectors you found on that separate part of the data. And then, so this is a, a way to get these eigenvalues in a cross-validated way. And maybe at the end I can I can show you a slide about that. Uh, but but yeah, so that, that is a very important question. Um, and something in the paper, we have several simulations uh, of different types of noise and how they influence the eigenspectrum estimation. Okay, so in order to uh, create, uh, we want a, a plot of neural activity that's that's more informative, for instance, than just this raster plot where we randomly sorted these neurons and, and have this this time axis or this stimulus axis. So we created this algorithm, which uh, you, it's an embedding algorithm, but you can also think of it as just resorting this this axis here. And if you resort this axis so that neurons that are correlated to each other are next to each other then you get something that uh, looks much uh, much more uh, visually, the, the clusters become much more visually apparent in the neural activity. So you can see groups of neurons. This is a group of around uh, close to 1,000 neurons that are firing together uh, throughout this recording. Uh, raster map also gets, uh, is able to capture kind of these long, these long uh, range correlations across many, many neurons, so across these many thousands of neurons. And so this is a group of, of many neurons that are firing in the same way. And these are representing kind of being able to capture these, these, lower, uh, these lower dimensional principal components that have more variance in the population activity. So how does a uh, raster map uh, kind of perform this, this uh, uh, apply these constraints of this power law multi-scale constraint to this embedding algorithm? So, I'll, I'll build up to it in a sense. So you can think of the, the first thing, naive thing you might do is to, to do k-means on your data and see uh, what the result is. So here's an example of k-means with 50 clusters on our data. And it, it is useful, you are, are you seeing structure in the, in the neural activity, uh, but these clusters aren't really in the right order in a sense. So if you look at a, a correlation matrix of, of neurons sorted using this, this k-means clustering, you can see a lot of off-diagonal structure. So we haven't perfectly sorted this neural activity in the way that we might have wanted to. And also we look at, if we plot the, this sorting as kind of a snake through principal components space, so every single neuron has a weighting onto, onto the first three principal components. And so that is a single, each neuron is a single dot here, and then we draw a line through these dots and that tells us basically the line through this, this embedding that we made. And if you look, this is, this is like a tangled ball. So we haven't really um, kind of separated the, captured kind of the more global structure of, of the neural activity by just doing this k-mean sorting. So 
Uh, you can start adding constraints to this. You can add local constraints where you, you basically smooth over the cluster means as you do the optimization. And this allows you to start putting things closer to each other that, that are more correlated to each other. Uh, you can see longer, larger groups of neurons that have similar activity. And you can start to see this untangling. And then finally, if you apply these multi-scale constraints uh, where you have, uh, you have um, more of these global constraints on, on the activity being similar, you're able to now get these, these larger groups of neurons being fi firing together, basically being put in the same spot on the, on the raster map if they fire together. And then this, this correlation matrix now looks, looks even better. You're, you're able to capture even more of the structure along this diagonal region uh, rather than having more of these off-diagonal subclusters. And if you look at this snake, it's more separated along, the, along, these, um, along this, this axis. And, and these colors are representing different portions of this axis. So it's better, it's better preserved that this global structure as well. So how do we apply these multi-scale constraints? So we're going, to, we're going to kind of reframe this embedding algorithm in terms of a matrix decomposition algorithm where we model each neuron R sub K, where K is the neuron, as a function of a scaling term times a function F, which is a function of the position of the neuron along this, this one-dimensional embedding, and time. And we make F a separable function of space and time where it's a sum of basis functions uh, times uh, coefficients, where these basis functions are have the, these spatial, different spatial scales. So the first basis function is going to have this slow, uh, this slow change across the manifold, and then these across manifold embedding, and then these these higher frequency ones are higher are higher basis functions with higher n. And then the coefficients are where we enforce this multi-scale constraint or this power law constraint. So these coefficients are forced so that the, the norms of each of these coefficients decays as one over n. So the first component has the most weight, and that's this one that changes the most slowly across our embedding dimension. And then as you increase n, uh, you, you start to decrease the amount of variance that, that these components have. So you're, you're trying to enforce the, this global similarity of neurons in the, in the embedding space. And the way that we optimize this is we can rewrite B and A as matrices, where B is going to be uh, neurons by components, where if we plug in X, and then A will be, uh, will be neuro, uh, sorry, time points by components. And then we do an iterative optimization where we fix where we put the neurons along the embedding and then we fit lambda and A, and then we fix lambda and A and we, and we fit B. Uh, and this is, this is easy to do in closed form because we have this uh, least squares loss function. And at, after, each optimis, after each iteration of the optimization, we force that these norms decay as one over N. And so, that, that's how we fit this, this algorithm. So let me show you some results. Basically, first kind of qualitatively exploring this power law in the stimulus-driven uh, in the stimulus-driven activity. So we can let's look at first the, the top principal components of the of the activity. So we're going to take our neural activity and project it into the top principal components. Sorry. Uh, so we have this is the projection of the neural activity into PC one and two, and we've sorted the neurons using raster map, and then we've also sorted the images. So this is, I mean, with any embedding algorithm, you can arbitrarily sort either axis. And so in this case, we've sorted each axis so that we can see, we can see kind of this coarse uh, one-dimensional structure along this projection of the data into these two principal components. And then uh, we can take PCs three through 10, and then we start to see kind of a more multi-dimensional structure uh, uh, where smaller subgroups of neurons are active together uh, in response to smaller groups of, uh, of stimuli. And then as we go to higher PCs, we see uh, fewer, fewer neurons um, being coactive together uh, in response to stimuli and then and so on. And so this is kind of a graphical way to represent this idea of this power law where there's this overall global structure which is, is driving all of these neurons throughout the stimulus space and then there's finer groups, subgroups of neurons that are driven for smaller groups of, of stimuli. And then we can also use raster map to kind of explore how neural activity co-varies with external variables. Um, and so in this case, we're going to be looking at 
electrophysiological recordings done by Nick Simitz, where he recorded from eight neural pixel probes simultaneously. These neural pixel probes are these high density electrodes that have 384 sites each. So he's able to record 3000 neurons simultaneously with, with EFIS, so with high temporal precision. And so we've, we've uh, embedded these neurons in, in this one dimensional raster map uh, from, from his recordings. And so you can see this global structure again uh, that we saw previously where there's large groups of neurons co-activating and then there's smaller subgroups of hundreds of neurons which are co-active together as well in, in this embedding. And so what, what we found in this work was that the spontaneous neural activity, so when the mouse is sitting in the dark, uh, but free to run, whisk, groom, sniff, all these different behaviors, that indeed these behaviors were what was driving this, this neural activity. So whether what the mouse was doing at any given time told us, uh, gave us uh, a prediction of the neural activity and this prediction was predict. Sorry, uh, this predicted about uh, a third of the explainable variance in the neural activity. And so, RasterMap is going to give us a way to visualize this prediction. So, for every single neuron, we're going to take the principal components of the motion energy of the face of the mouse, and we're going to use those to predict the neural activity. And we're going to replace basically. We're going to sort these neurons that have been predicted in the same way we sorted them with RasterMap above. So now we get this graphical representation of our prediction where we can start to look, okay, this prediction did a good job of, of representing kind of these global structures. Maybe some of these smaller subgroups of neurons were well represented uh, with this behavioral prediction. You can start to go in and say, okay, there's different subgroups of neurons that were not well predicted by the behavior. And it might be easier to see them graphically when you, when you make a plot of, of this sort. Uh, so, and then there's a, another Another thing you can do with raster map, which might be you want to explore spatial relationships between neurons in your recording. And I'll do this uh, on an example of uh, zebrafish neural activity. So there's, uh, there's many thousands of neurons being recorded here. And as they light up, that's, that's them firing this red color. And you can see the stimulus that's being shown at any given time is this, is this block here. And then this bottom circle, as when it's getting bigger, that means the fish is swimming. So there, there's uh, you're able to have behavioral and uh, and uh, visual correlates uh, of this neural activity. So here's what this neural activity looks like, sorted by raster map. So this is 64,000 neurons recorded simultaneously by Yumu when he was in Misha Aaron's lab. And so you can see that where that there's many thousands of neurons doing very similar things. And then there will be smaller subgroups of neurons that are doing different things in this fish brain. And what I'm going to do to explore the spatial relationships between neurons is I'm going to take groups of 500 neurons each and color them based on their position along this embedding graph. And then you can look at these different uh, groups of neurons and see, are they, are they co-localized in the brain? Are they global components? Uh, you can also, for instance, maybe make a plot of how correlated each of these clusters is to a certain behavior along this axis as well. Uh, so it gives you different ways to explore your data. And, and finally, uh, I'll tell you quickly about uh, our, our 2D extension of raster map, which is basically we can do this the same, uh, the same tricks that we did using 1D raster map, but then use basis functions, which are two dimensional. In this case, the basis functions are principal components from natural images, but you could use any uh, complete basis set in two dimensions that you want to use. And so if we use two dimensional raster map, now we're going to have neurons embedded in the 2D space, which is going to be more similar to what you often see when people do TC plots, for instance. And so I'm going to show you uh, embeddings. These are recordings done by Mihaly. So he did four recordings in five different mice. And this, this summed up to around 300,000 neurons. So you can kind of make this functional atlas of all of these neurons in these in these recordings and you can kind of see islands of, of neurons that are active together uh, you could plot for instance you could color these based on what receptive fields these came from or what mouse they came from what cell type they were uh, all these different things can be can be done kind of in this uh, in this visualization and in the graphical user interface for raster map we've implemented a way for the user to be able to draw boxes around these little islands uh, and you can also run uh, density-based clustering as well to kind of to capture these islands, but you can also manually kind of draw clusters uh, because 
it, the the 2D representation is still hard for hard to parse. Like if there's an advantage of using 2D in that you have another dimension to play with. You're able to better explain the variance of your data, but it's still it's hard to visualize the two dimen the 2D because you you still want to visualize how this varies, for instance, across stimuli. So if you draw these boxes, then you can get in the in the GUI you get this plot uh, where these boxes are are sorted here. Uh, by actually by raster map 1D, and then you can plot basically neurons by stimuli it within this 2D raster map. So this allows you to kind of explore your data maybe more easily. And then finally, how well does raster map work quantitatively? So uh, we we use a benchmark where we're trying the what we're trying to optimize basically is how correlated is an, a given neuron to its n nearest neighbors. So, and this is the mean of the activity of its n nearest neighbor. So if we have this neuron here, we wanna say how correlated is it to the activity of its one nearest neighbor, to the average activity of its four nearest neighbors, 16, 64, 56, 1,024, and so on. And so we can, we can we make these curves of, of this correlation uh, of neurons. We average this over, over all the neurons that we subsample. And we can make this curve as a function of number of neighbors for various different embedding algorithms. So, Raster map, for instance, on zebrafish data performs better than UMAP, TSNE, and PCA in terms of capturing these local uh, these local uh, groups of clusters within around 64 to 256 neurons. You can see is doing better than than these other algorithms. And then similarly, in this this large scale data with 300,000 neurons, uh, raster map outperforms TSNE, UMAP, and PCA in kind of this middle range of, of neighbors where we have these kind of so somewhat larger groups of neighbors than just uh, where uh, than groups of maybe one to four. So so that's um that's pretty much it. I'll just tell you also that raster map is is fast. So raster map runs in about ten minutes on three hundred thousand neuron data, and it, compared to TSNE, which takes around seventy minutes, it's not as fast as as UMAP, um, and then it's and then also PCA is faster. All right, so in summary, uh, I've showed you that neural activity is high dimensional. So this means that we need to think about ways to visualize high dimensional data. And, and so we came up with this algorithm raster map that's, that's capturing this high dimensional structure and is also fast and open source. You can pip install raster map and, and draw clusters and, and play with your, load your data and run it and, and play with the, the clusters in, in this 2D space. You can also, install raster map and run it the same way you run scikit-learn packages. And that's it. I'd like to thank my advisors, Marius Pakisaryu and Kenneth Harris, and all the collaborators I've had at UCL and Janelia. And also I just started my group at Janelia and I'm looking for postdocs and students who are interested in these kinds of computational questions of how the brain encodes sensory and behavioral representations. Um, and that's it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. That was that was really a lovely talk. Um, I want to give. I know I agree. I think there's a bit of a lag between when when we're talking and when questions come in. So I want to give people a couple seconds to to get some questions in. But maybe I want to start with one, um, which is that you know you you talk about uh, that you consciously made this open source um, and something we think about in Nylearn is a lot is the usability of methods and the availability of methods. Um, could you talk a little bit about maybe why you made that decision and uh, how you think um, having the software implementation helps with the, with the method itself, testing the method itself? Yeah, um, I think I definitely, that's, that's an important component. The fact that it's, it's the same as any scikit-learn package means that someone can quickly just plug in raster map the same way they plug in TSNE and test all these methods. And honestly, someone that, that's interested in, in embedding their data should try all these different methods because they're not that slow to run. Uh, so I recommend once you set it up for one, you can set it up for all of them. Um, and so, yeah, I think, I think that's a big advantage of it. And there's lots of great packages in, in Python that, that make these, these algorithms fast to run. For instance, this is accelerated by number. Mm-hmm. All right, I think, here we go. Okay, I think there's a, a question for you. I can read it out if it's easier or if you 
Let's see. All right. So uh, the question is, did I understand correctly that we can easily apply raster map to arbitrary data, even non-neural? Yeah, you can apply it to any high dimensional data set and see what happens. It, it's it, when you're applying it to different data sets, uh, there's one thing you can you can do, which is to uh, which is to change this. Uh, sorry, I went too far back to change the power law spectrum. So you can actually there's a parameter that you can set that. Sorry, I don't think I said it where this, this parameter here of one over N can be changed to be one over N to any arbitrary alpha. So you can change that in your data to play with how much you want to preserve local structure versus preserve global structure. Uh, and this is a kind of idea that, that could be extended to other types of, of methods, like maybe in a regression, you might want to apply a power law to your, to your data as well, or enforce a power law, that sort of thing, to be able to capture high dimensional structure. And then Eva Dyer asks a question as well, which is, uh, I might have missed it. Do you estimate the power law from the data? No, we do not, um, in part because that would require the user to kind of tell us if they have two repeats of data, or in the case of if we're estimating on arbitrary data, we would use something um, where we would have to split by neurons and time. That's another, another way we cross-validate things. So we're not doing that for the user because that's very, uh, case dependent. Nice. So yeah, I think I think the other thing I find really interesting about this is the the fact that you um, in some ways, it seems so far from fMRI data. In other ways, it seems like you could easily imagine sort of the fact that you're recording all of these planes at once in cortex that the, you're getting this large sample and you're able to look across the whole population to kind of look at these dynamics. Um, and I'm just wondering, do you do you see personally any kind of connection to, to maybe fMRI work or MEG work or... or this uh, at a human level scale. Yeah, I, I think I think this is the sort of algorithm that would work well for that type of data because, in particular, uh, raster maps agnostic to temporal correlations. It's it's like PCA where every bin is independent of another bin. It's not thinking about these kinds of autocorrelation functions. And so, in data where there's a slow time scale where you're only sampling at one to three hertz or something, then that's the kind of data that that this is 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 good for. Uh, if you have some kind of temporal dynamics you're trying to capture, maybe you want to use some some uh, slightly different method or extend a method like this to, to try to capture uh, temporal correlations. Perfect. Thank you. Um, thanks for inviting me. No, thanks so much for coming. OK, if there are no further questions, maybe uh, what we can do is there's We'll start the break, and I just want to uh, plug again quickly that we have this online town. Um, so if you if you go to the uh, event website and you click on the hyperlink on break, it will take you to a little portal where you can actually kind of interact um, in a virtual uh, room to, to meet other attendees and to chat about the talks this morning, um, which have both been really lovely so far, and we're looking forward to the rest of the day. So thanks so much.